Good afternoon, everyone. So I'd like to start off by posing a few simple questions for all of you. How easy is it for you to get access to health care you need? For the folks in this room in Austin, Texas, it's actually probably not, that, not too difficult. If you need a specialist, eh, it's still probably not too hard. But what if you live in Glendive, Montana, population 5200? How are you going to get access to the specialists you need? What if you live in Haiti? How are you going to get access to care there? These are the kinds of questions we ask when we're trying to understand how accessible healthcare is, not just to folks in this country, but folks all over the world. The challenge of healthcare is really getting the right provider to the right patient at the right time. And medicine is really a fragmented beast. Getting care to people is very fragmented. Medicine is fragmented across a few different dimensions. First is medical discipline. Right? There's dermatology, cardiology, ophthalmology, all these different ologies. It's about 30 some odd of them, depending on who you ask and how you count. Medicine is fragmented across level of authority. You have nurses and doctors, PAs, NPs, all different kinds of acronyms to do all kinds of different things. Medicine is also obviously fragmented across geography. Um, and lastly, it's fragmented across time. So if you add all of these up, if you add all of these up, getting the right patient to the right provider at the right time is actually a pretty difficult problem. Um, now, not only is it hard to get access to these people, it's also really expensive. Most medical care in this country is delivered in pretty expensive retail or physical building environments. So this is the new John Hopkins Medical Center. It opened up a couple of years ago. They spent about a decade building it, and it cost $1.1 billion to build a couple of buildings. Um, this stuff is really expensive, and obviously people in Haiti and all over the world can't get access to this care. So these are kind of the, the challenges we're trying to solve. So, you know, how do we solve these problems, this access problem? Well, the general notion to that is a notion called telemedicine. Right? And telemedicine is just kind of a fancy industry term that folks like to use that just really means some care provider, whoever they are, is not physically here, and they're trying to help deliver care to that patient in some way. And there's a lot of different ways telemedicine manifests. The first and oldest was really the telephone. Now, obviously, the problem with the telephone is that it's audio only, and you kind of got to stand around and do this thing. It's just not a particular, particularly elegant experience, and you lack that video component, which is going to be crucial for a lot of forms of medical care. More recently, in the past 10 or 20 years, we've seen the rise of Skype, right? Skype-like video calls. And there's a lot of services out there now that actually let patients just go to a computer and do a web chat with a doctor. Now you can see the patient's face, their skin color, their emotional reactions, how they're feeling. I mean, video adds a lot of subtlety and power to that interaction. Even more recently, in just the past few years now, we're using our smartphones to deliver all forms of telemedicine, taking pictures and obviously doing mobile videos. You know, putting your foot up on a laptop cart is going to be kind of hard. But with the phone, now it becomes easier to do these kinds of things. But there's still the challenge we face in delivering mobile video is that all of these devices still, they don't really allow for a really seamless interaction. What if you want to have, be able to just talk to a patient, you being a nurse or a doctor, and have someone else far away helping you? And what if you want those people to be here as if they were in your shoes? None of these devices really help solve that problem, right? Because they all require you use your hands, or you have a laptop over here, on a cart or a desk. There's just not a really elegant way to solve these issues. Uh, well, we finally have a solution, and that is, of course, Google Glass. So what is Google Glass? Um, well, it is just a computer, actually. And that's all it is. So it has the same basic components as a laptop or a camera, or any uh, laptop or smartphone, or any of these other devices. Right? Your laptop is a computer on your desk. Your iPhone is a computer in your pocket. And now Google Glass is a computer on your face. So uh, seriously, right? And it's the, actually the most socially acceptable computer I've found that you can put on your face. Um, <laughs> we, we tried to tell nurses to strap a helmet cam to their head, but they weren't really down with that. Um, so it's, it's a really novel way to do it. Um, and it's kind of sexy-ish, depending on your definition of sexy. Um, so but why is this actually compelling, right? So the use case is, of course, the camera here is on the front, and it faces outwards. So the video stream to whoever's receiving that stream, right, they're seeing what you're seeing in first person as if they were there in your shoes. And then, of course, the other key aspect is that it's hands-free. So, so you can work with your hands. <laughs> I'm supposed to be hands-free today, but I guess that didn't work out. Um, but it's hands-free, so I can be treating a wound or whatever I need to do while maintaining use of both hands. Um, so instead of just talking about it, let me give you guys a quick demo. OK, Glass, start eyesight. And if the, if the stars align, these guys should be able to beam into me. It might take them a few seconds here. And hopefully you all get to see yourselves get ready to wave. As you guys can see, I can turn my head and everything, and it'll go. 
We are running on some older school Wi-Fi, but um, it's, it's a pretty nifty concept. Um, and so we're now using this for live medical care in a whole bunch of different places. Um, can we go back to the slides? Perfect. Thank you. Um, thanks to the tech guys getting this. We were really scared it wasn't going to work. So where are we actually using this, right? What are the actual use cases for making this useful in healthcare? There's a few of them. So, oh, oh, demo, okay. So the first one is in ambulances. So, right, you have paramedics and EMTs going out in the field, and these folks, they don't have eight years of medical training like doctors, so getting doctors out in the field seems like a really compelling way to use this device. Um, so we have doctors now beaming in to paramedics and EMTs in the field so that they can really provide that virtual care and assistance um, for both for consults, uh, treatments, as well as triaging. Um, triaging there is actually a really interesting concept. Everyone talks about healthcare being too expensive, and so now we're actually having doctors beam into the paramedics, and they're helping provide orders on where that patient should go. So, so not all patients necessarily need to go to a level one trauma center. Maybe they can go to a level three trauma center or an urgent care center, and ultimately help save the system costs. We're also seeing a lot of interest from emergency rooms. Half of all patient wait time in an ER is waiting for the doctor to show up, right? So the problem with um, ER fundamentally is that any patient can show up any time of day with any problem, and they're supposed to theoretically receive really great care. Now, there's not going to be 25 or 35 different medical specialists sitting around all day doing nothing. So these guys are busy off in a patient in a clinic with their own, you know, seeing patients. So we're not using this as a really elegant way to beam physicians into the ERs while those guys are in clinic. So in the two minutes you know, between their patient appointments, they can at least beam in, provide a consult, and give some orders so that that patient can get treated, and we can help reduce that patient wait time in the emergency room. We're also seeing lots of interest in surgery. Surgeons love cool new gadgets, of course, and it's a hands-free computer, right? And they're obviously working with their hands, kind of bloody, and got to keep them clean. So they're seeing a lot of interest for doing remote consultations. So you could theoretically get the number one cardiothoracic guy in New York beamed into Austin or beamed into Haiti, wherever you might need to be, and of course he can provide that first person perspective. We're also seeing a lot of interest for education, especially in surgery. Believe it or not, right now, the only really ways they try and do video in surgery are either through lights in the cameras, which are okay, but they're at kind of a different angle, uh, or they actually bring in camera crews into the operating room, and they'll actually have a ladder going up over the surgeon's shoulders trying to shoot a video in. And of course, if the guy steps over just a bit, now you've ruined the shot. Um, so getting video in surgery has actually been a huge problem. Um, and this is gonna make a lot of, create a lot of value for medical education. You can also imagine this being used for virtual rounding and virtual shadowing. I'd imagine some of you in this room want to go on to be doctors, and hopefully by the time you folks are in medical school, you will be using, you'll be actually watching shadowing and going through residency programs using glasses, right? So you'll be able to see into the hospital and go on rounds with the doctor virtually, and you'll have a whole classroom of students being able to discuss what's going on, what's happening, pause and rewind the video, right, in a live clinic setting. So lots of fascinating opportunities for medical education. We're also seeing lots of demand in the ICU. Again, the challenge with an ICU is that staffing a full-time intensivist in every ICU is a really hard problem, um, and it's really expensive. So we're now beaming, having nurses and residents in these ICUs available so that intensivists can beam into them. Um, so lots of exciting interest there. So we started everything we're working on about nine months ago, and we've come a long way. We faced a lot of challenges, lots of problems, but the one key thing we've learned is that this actually works and that we now have nurses and doctors using this every day in live hospitals in the US today, a few hospitals in California. Um, and it, so what we've realized is that we can use this device for novel forms of telemedicine. Um, this actually can help deliver real novel forms of care. Now, what's interesting about Google Glass is that this device is kind of funny looking, right? I mean, these don't even really look like glasses. Um, they say they do, but not really. This is glass one, and in a few years, we're gonna look back at glass two, three, and four, and, and look back at this guy and say, wow, that was so primitive and, and just kind of old school. Um, so this technology is gonna be trending towards right, going away and, and getting out of your way. Um, and eventually, we're gonna be to a, uh, I think I killed it, sorry. Um, and so this is gonna go out of the way and so that you won't even be able to know that it's there. It's gonna eventually look like your glasses, and soon you won't be able to tell Google glasses from Kyle's glasses, or Jimmy's glasses, or Laura's glasses. Um, and that's gonna be really exciting, because that means now, you know, healthcare and transparency and communication will be completely seamless. So what's kind of the end result here? Where is all of this trending? What is our inevitable truth that we're trending towards? 
Well, you know, there's so many things that we take for granted around us today, right? We have electricity everywhere, we have plumbing, we have radio waves, we have this building. All of these things are happening in the background that we don't even notice uh, that are there on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, and so what we really think that this device is the first step towards is going to ultimately be wireless, hands-free, audio, video, and text-based communications. So that hopefully everyone everywhere in the world will be able to communicate with everyone everywhere in the world through audio, video, and text effectively without even thinking. And just in the not too distant future, it's going to look a little bit something like this. Thanks so much. Take care, guys. And you'll be able to play with these at the X Labs.